Good morning, Mr. Fine. Can we hear from you? Good morning, Marianne. Can you hear me okay? That's off, right? We hear you fine. Thanks. All right, great. Good morning, Mayor Sladek. Good morning. You sound wonderful. Good to have you. Ah, oh, glad to be here. Looks like people are slow getting here. Do, do we have an in-person contingent as well? Uh, we do, okay. and um, a a large one. <laughs> I believe I believe we have our quorum already. Yes, good. quorum has been met in the room, so we are in good shape. And, and Mr. Mr. Chair, we are recording and streaming live um, at your leisure. You can begin the agenda. All right, perfect. All right, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to this hybrid Metro Plan Orlando MAC meeting. And I'd like to call this meeting to order. My name is Keith Trace and I'll be chairing the meeting today. We also have an illustrious team of folks working to ensure this meeting runs smoothly. We have several committee members here physically present. Uh, to make our quorum and then the rest are joining virtually. I'll ask all committee members attending in person to please speak clearly so those joining this virtually can hear um, our discussion. And then since we're all wearing masks, I'm taking mine <laughs> off to <laughs> taking mine off to speak, uh, we'll need to have extra effort to ensure good audio quality. Committee members joining us online will participate in the discussion and vote on action items. And we'll ask you to mute your microphone when you're not speaking or and use the raise hand feature uh, on your Zoom toolbar. The public will also be able to participate virtually as well. Um, now it's time for the Pledge of Allegiance. And today I will ask Mayor Anderson to lead us in the pledge. All right, thank you very much. At today's meeting, uh, we will keep our microphones muted unless you've been recognized to speak, and then we will use the raise hands feature to participate in discussion. There are two public comment points in this meeting. Members of the public participating virtually uh, who would like to speak will use the raise hands feature on the Zoom toolbar. Um, if attending by phone, you can also hit star nine to request to be recognized. We will also be accepting, uh, we have also expect, um, accepted comments via email and phone messages before the meeting. Those guidelines for public comment are posted at metroplanorlando.org backslash virtual meetings. Uh, we want this and all future meetings to be accessible to all. Participants may join by computer, tablet, or phone. If you need accommodations to participate in the future, please contact Metro Plan Orlando staff. And at this time, I would like to recognize Alex Trogger of Metro Plan Orlando staff for the agenda review. Great. Good morning, everyone, um, and, and thank all our committee members for attending both here in person and, uh, and, and virtually. We uh, do appreciate your pa uh, patience as we operate in this hybrid format. Um, and again, you know, when we're in this hybrid format, um, all members present, we do does create a quorum, which allows all of our members participating virtually to actually be marked present. So um, RSVPs are really important for us. So thank you um, for always letting us know how you'll be attending, uh, whether you'll be attending. That really helps us uh, produce these meetings, especially when we have action on the agenda. Um, we are observing uh, CDC guidelines. Um, so we do ask um, that while you're in the Metro Plan Orlando suite that you do keep your, your mask on while you know, not speaking or consuming. Um, um, relating to the printed agenda, a, a couple um, 
changes, first casting. Anna Taylor will be representing the Department of Transportation today um, in, in lieu of Rakinia. Um, we also, um, and I apologize for any confusion when if you were reviewing the agenda in advance of the meeting, the formatting is a little bit different. We actually have uh, two sets of action items, kind of two sets of presentations. As you see, and as we kind of go through today's meeting, uh, you'll see that that format actually, I think, provides um, a good kind of introduction to the information before you take action on um, what's in front of us today. So apologize for any confusion, um, but given our circumstances, uh, we, we believe that was a, a more appropriate format for the content today. Also relating to the agenda um, and at your places, there is uh, the 2022 legislative priorities. Um, we um, did not include that in the printed agenda. Our apologies. Uh, if we haven't done so already, we'll be uploading that document on uh, up to the uh, up to Zoom so for our virtual members. Um, but it's actually in your Tatum unit as well, and it's also a printed copy at your places. Uh, Virginia Whittington will be speaking to that later in her presentation, um, you know, on the agenda. But we just wanted to make sure that you have that in front of you. Also relating to the agenda. Um, an upcoming uh, meeting of potential interest is the 2021 Florida Autonomy uh, Automated Vehicle Summit. Um, it's November 29th, um, and it's taking place here in Orlando at the Rosen Shingle Creek. Um, there's some information, I believe, a web link um, in general information. So if you're interested, uh, check that out. And it is a kind of a statewide uh, summit taking place here in the Orlando area. So uh, with that, um, we'll now move on. I'll ask uh, Ms. Lisa Smith to call attendance. Good morning. I will ask all committee members joining us online to unmute yourselves now for the roll call. While those in the room, please keep your microphones off until call. Online participants, please make sure your video is on if possible so that we can confirm it's you. You will find the unmute and video buttons on your Zoom screen. Please say here or present when your name is called. Anderson? Here. Anselmo? Here. Cole? Here. Dallas? Here. Firstner? Foraker? Henson? Here. McCann? Here. O'Brien? Ramos? Sladek? Here. Smith? Here. Trace. Here. Mr. Chairman, that completes the roll call and we do have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now hear public comments on action items. Do we have anyone who wants to speak on any of those items? If so, if you will please use your raise hand function on your screen or press star nine on your phone keypad. When we call your name, the host will unmute your microphone. You will see a button pop up that says host wants to unmute you. Please accept that prompt and activate your Microphone. We will ask you to provide your name and address for the record. Please hold your comments to two minutes or less. Are there any comments at this time? There are no raised hands on the attendee side, Mr. Chairman. All right. Was there anything submitted um, by phone or email before the meeting? Nothing was submitted in advance of the meeting. I do not believe we have anyone here in person. All right. Thank you. Uh, up next, we will hear from our agency partners. FDOT and Florida Turnpike are making presentations later on the agenda. Um, so we can badger them with questions at that point. And then um, up first is Ms. Taylor with FDOT. Good morning. Um, for the FDOT report today, I just wanted to let you all know that the department conducted our work program public hearing last week um, with an open house at the DeLand office on Thursday night. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, next month at your board meeting, we will be bringing the work program forward uh, in a presentation to um, show the projects that were funded in the work program for the Metro Plan area. Um, I also wanted to let you all know that the uh, resurfacing project on State Road 435 Kirkman Road um, will be wrapping up uh, by the end of next week. Um, and finally, um, I wanted to let you know that um, we have community engagement underway for pre-construction for the Oviedo project out on State Road 426 from Pine Avenue to Avenue B. 
Um, so we will be uh, hosting an open house on that project on January the 13th. And that concludes my report. All right, thank you. I think <clears throat> Mayor Sladek would be uh, excited about that project kicking off and uh, congratulations on re-election um, on Tuesday. Thank you. And I am excited that it's finally kicking off. <laughs> All right, any questions uh, from Ms. Taylor? All right, up next is uh, Mr. Miles O'Keefe with links. Good morning, everyone. A um, few things to share with you all. Uh, just recently was the Florida Public Transportation Association's uh, conference. Uh, links came away from that with three awards, two for marketing campaigns, the, the third for uh, to recognize our safety and security team for a multi-jurisdictional uh, task force they put together with the TSA, GOA, the respective emergency management offices in our tri-county area, as well as the city of Orlando. So we're very proud of our, our team members for the work that they continue to do. Um, in addition, we have, uh, starting this weekend, actually November 7th, the American Public Transportation Association's annual conference and expo is here at the Orange County Convention Center. So it being in our backyard, we're the, we're the host agency. So numerous Link staff members will be volunteering at that event, um, providing orientation, registration, uh, general you know, information about the area and our transportation services to the guests from around the country that will be coming in for the next several days. Uh, as part of that, we will also be uh, kicking off a demonstration project of uh, we're looking at it as a fully electric trip. So we will be utilizing electric coach buses to transport individuals from the airport uh, over to the convention center area. And then they'll be able to utilize an, a different electric bus uh, on our Link 38 with express service from uh, Universal Orlando to downtown Orlando. And then of course we have our limo fleet utilizing 100% electric buses now. So it's kind of that total trip from airport to downtown Orlando what individuals can expect to see on different types of buses. So we're very excited to be running that demonstration for about a month. Uh, so hopefully all of you have a chance to go out and just experience the technologies and um, get a glimpse of the future of public transportation here in Central Florida. Uh, aside from that, uh, there was a, a national update uh, on just how transit is doing. Uh, roughly, you're seeing 61% of pre-pandemic levels. Lynx is just in line with that, sitting at about 60% of uh, pre-pandemic ridership. And I believe that is all I have for my updates. Yes, that is all, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Keith. Oh, Keith, that's uh, exciting news about the electric buses. Um, any questions for uh, links? All right, so now we'll move on. Um, our next update is from Florida Turnpike. Did you guys want to speak now or just during the- Okay. Uh, good morning, committee members. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, it's just, I have a reminder that I'll be back in the December cycle uh, meetings and I'll be presenting the tentative work program to all the committees and uh, to the board. Um, currently, the Turnpike is presenting the work program or finishing up presenting the work program uh, in South Florida as well as West Florida. Um, so uh, just be on the lookout uh, for any additional information um, before the December cycle meetings. And that is the end of my report. Thank you, Mr. Fine. Any uh, questions for the turnpike? All right, thank you. Um, at this time, we will take up our first two action items. Our first item is the approval of the meeting minutes from our September 2nd meeting, which are found on tab one of your agenda packet. Hope everyone had a chance to read them. Are there any corrections, revisions, or items that need to be brought to staff's attention? Move approval. All right. We have a motion for approval by Mayor Dallas. Do I hear a second? Second. All right. We have a second. Um, is there any discussion? I'm just going to give it a second for online folks. All right. Um, and this is a voice vote. All committee members online, please unmute your microphones. For those in the room, just speak out. All in favor, please, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? 
All right, those opposed? Um, so it passes unanimously. Our next item is the approval of the 2022 board committee meeting schedule. Uh, those proposed calendar uh, dates are in your agenda packets and it follows the same cycle as we did this year. We have eight dates uh, for MAC meetings in 2022, which will take place the Thursday prior to the MPO board meeting at 9.30 a.m. in this room. Uh, the calendar is meant to set the meeting dates and we will get separate information on the meeting formats. Um, this is found in tab two of your agendas. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve the 2022 meeting schedule? Move approval. All right. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Those opposed? All right. Uh, item two, tab two passes unanimously. All right. For presentations, as noted in the agenda, these first two presentations are for informational purposes. Uh, although the we will provide information on projects as they are um, included in the requests for the um, uh, the TIP amendments, participation or participants online, please use your raise hand function uh, to be recognized if you have a question. And then you can also um, raise your hand during the presentation, and we will hold questions until the end. Uh, first presentation will provide information on projects being funded through Metro Plan Orlando region as a result of the federal stimulus program under the American Rescue Plan Act. Mr. John Taylor from FDOT will be presenting today. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is John Tyler. I'm the director of operations for FDOT District 5. Very excited to be here today. We've got a, a great opportunity uh, before us uh, for Central Florida, Metro Plan Orlando and FDOT and uh, excited to, to be here to talk about it. So I'm gonna kick things off and then I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to other members of our team, Catalina and Todd are gonna come in and talk behind me and talk about some specifics. So I'm gonna kind of set the stage. Uh, earlier this year, the, the Florida legislature uh, passed, uh, passed legislation that basically funneled some additional federal stimulus dollars to the FDOT for the purpose of accelerating and advancing some roadway and bridge projects around the state. Uh, even before that legislation was signed by the governor, the DOT started working on how it was going to figure out how that money was going to be spent around the state. Uh, they tasked each district with coming up with projects that could be advanced, and each district produced a list uh, in that that every single district produced a list of projects that would that would easily use all the money that was available. Uh, so there was a lot of opportunities around the state. All of the districts and ultimately the central offices list followed a, a couple of fundamental guiding principles that I wanted to share with you today. Uh, the projects that were submitted uh, and ultimately selected, they needed to be priority projects, priority for, for, the, for, the, for the region uh, identified on, uh, on the respective NPO, TPO priority lists. They needed to be projects with regional significance. They needed to be ready for advancement, ready to go for construction. They also needed to be able to address the agency's vital few with safety, mobility, and innovation in mind. Uh, we wanted to, to definitely make sure that we are addressing both mobility, safety as well. Uh, and then also diversity. And when, you know, diversity, we're looking at diversity of, of geography, you know, spreading things around the state, size of projects. We didn't want to focus on mega projects or large projects. We wanted to have a good range of projects uh, across, the, across the spectrum of size. We also wanted to focus on different types of projects, uh, interchange projects, rural projects, uh, urban, uh, urban projects. We wanted to have a, a nice, uh, uh, again, diverse offering, uh, as well as being able to advance project phases to be ready for future stimulus money should it, uh, should it come forward. And we've probably all been following what's been happening in, uh, in Congress. Hopefully they will be passing some, some legislation that will also be steering some additional funds to the state of Florida in the near future. So we wanted to make sure that we were priming the pump, making sure that we were advancing other project phases as well so that we could take, take advantage of opportunities in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a, a quick overview of the projects that were selected for the District 5 uh, region of FDOT. Uh, a lot of the projects there are were you know were geared towards the interstate. So you see some 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 projects on on I four uh, south of Orlando. Uh, 
uh, and I-4 up in Seminole County. We also had some projects over on I-95. Uh, those three projects there on I-95, two of those were specifically for advancing uh, those projects into design with one being for construction. Um, again, kind of that priming the pump, as well as that State Road 50 widening improvements in Sumter County, that was advancing right away funds so that we can uh, be ready for construction in the future of that project. Then we also had another half a dozen or so of our resurfacing projects that uh, were in some areas of high crash uh, conditions that we wanted to accelerate, uh, accelerate their delivery and add, in addition to doing resurfacing, we wanted to capitalize on the opportunity and, and expand the scope of those projects to include some safety enhancements. So this kind of gives you a good broad idea of, of how things were, were distributed around, uh, around District 5. And what this means for, for, for Metroplan Orlando is over $125 million of construction, specifically construction funds, uh, we're selected for for the projects that we're gonna we're gonna talk about today. So on the next slides, I'm gonna kind of drill down a little bit deeper for the projects in the Metro Plan or Lair, uh, uh, Metro Plan Orlando area. Thank you. So on I4 uh, south of the I4 Ultimate. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is where the lion's share of the construction funds uh, were were steered towards, and we're gonna talk about these projects very extensively in the in the following presentation. So. Uh, item number one is a westbound express lane from I extending from where I for ultimate is going to uh, to be opening up here at the first part of uh, of, of next year 2022. Um, an additional express lane running all the way down to 536 and we're going to talk about what that is and why it is um, in, in the next presentation, but uh, over $50 million of construction for that um, item project number two is state road 528. Uh, ramp widening. So this is the I-4 westbound to State Road 528 eastbound ramp, uh, replacing that or widening that uh, that that structure. And then uh, the third project is I-4 at State Road 535 interchange reconstruction, uh, another $50 million uh, plus project uh, that will be advancing to construction. Next slide, please. Shifting to the to the north up in Seminole County. Next slide, please. Uh, we have two projects. Uh, that are going to be interchange operational improvements. Uh, the first at 1792, uh, just, uh, just south of the St. John's River for about $3 million of, of construction improvements. And then I-4 at County Road 46A will also be doing some improvements uh, in that, uh, in, at that interchange as well uh, to the tune of about uh, 5.4 million. Uh, next slide, please. So that's kind of gives you the overview of, of the major projects that we're going to be working on uh, with these stimulus funds. And in our next presentation, we're going to dig a little bit deeper uh, to help you understand the, the, the purpose and the reason for the, for the amendments that are, that are on the action items for today. Any questions? Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Was there anyone online that had any questions? There are no raised hands on the virtual side, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Our next presentation, we will hear from um, Ms. Chacon and Mr. Helton with FDOT on the I-4 Beyond the Ultimate Project. Take it away. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here today to give you an update on the I-4 Beyond the Ultimate project and tell you a little bit about more about the projects that John just mentioned and how it all ties together with the two uh, voting items after our presentation today. Um, next slide, please. So the agenda for today, I'm gonna go over uh, an overview on the I-4 Beyond the Ultimate project. And then we're gonna talk about the Westbound Express Lane Extension um, project, why we need it and how we came up with, with the project. And then we're gonna talk about specific projects at I-4 at Sand Lake Road Interchange, I-4 at Daryl Carter Parkway Interchange and I-4 at 535 Interchange. Next slide, please. So we were here back in July of this year uh, to provide an update on I-4B on the ultimate. And we shared with everyone that um, at the district, <clears throat> excuse me, we're trying to, we realize that we have needs on I-4 and we're trying to come up with um, innovative ideas on how we advance these projects. We know that the segments that came from the um, PD&E study, they were mega projects and the majority of them 
were not funded for construction. So we've been trying to um, look at specific areas to the north and to the south and see what are those immediate needs and what we can do to advance this project. So we wanna be able to meet growing, growing demands along I-4 outside of the I-4 ultimate project. Next, next slide, please. So some of the opportunities um, and new tools that are available to us when we are doing this evaluation, finding out what are the needs and what can we do to ad advance these needs include, we have updated policies when it comes to how do we provide the capacity that's needed to I-4. So we have the FDOT managed lanes policy versus the express lane policy. The updated policy basically gives us more flexibility on how we add capacity to I-4. So we have managed lanes. They include uh, truck lanes. They could be HOV lanes. They could also be express lanes, but we have more options available to us. We also have more uh, guidance and lessons learned when it comes to the direct connects. Um, so that's basically a connection strictly straight to the express lanes and also how you enter and exit the express lanes. We also have new parameters when it comes to the separation type um, of the express lanes. And then any lessons learned from our mega projects where it, all of the projects that we, that we have, as well as industry feedback. We wanna make sure that we um, are successful at delivering these projects that the industry can support them and, and be, help us deliver the projects that we need. So we wanna look at the size and cost of the projects. Next slide, please. The evaluation approach is the same as you know we, we share with, with everyone back in July. We want to maintain the purpose at need that was already established during the project development and environment study or PDNE study. We wanna stay within the right of way that was already defined for that study, but we wanna use those new tools that are available to us to advance these projects. We wanna provide similar traffic operations, um, ultimately identify cost savings opportunities, um, and then engage our stakeholders. Next slide, please. So here is the um, slide that um, you just saw earlier from John's presentation. Um, one of the things that stood out the most during our evaluation while we were doing our analysis and what are the areas that critically need something sooner rather than later uh, was the end of the express lanes and the westbound direction. So where the express lanes end, the ones that are being built by Afro Ultimate, we were forecasting a future bottleneck at this location and we needed to find a way on how to mitigate this. What can we do to, to address the bottleneck and provide the additional capacity that's needed? So we've been analyzing options and uh, vetting the best concept um, that, that's gonna meet our needs. Some of the ideas that we had was utilizing the existing shoulder in the westbound direction during peak hours. Um, this is also known as part-time shoulder use. One of the biggest challenges that we um, identified was that we needed a lot of support from local and law enforcement to make sure that it was a safe operation. Um, so we did not pursue the option any further. Um, another option was to build the mega project, the, the billion of, of billions of dollars project to be able to provide that additional capacity to I-4. And unfortunately, the, the size of the project is so big that it was, it was very challenging for us to receive the funds needed. So uh, in the end, we arrived with a solution that balances all of these um, challenges and, and all of these elements that we needed to, to keep in mind. And this um, solution is extending a single buffer separated express lane from where I for ultimate ends in the westbound direction um, all the way to west of stereo 536. And we call this option the tube. And I'm gonna explain to you why uh, we call it the tube. But what the tube does is that it um, provides that capacity that we need um, while balancing uh, cost considerations as well as disrupting traffic. As you'll see on my next slide, we are in essence widening uh, into the existing shoulder of I-4. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna walk you through the tube. Um, and as I mentioned, we are forecasting a future bottleneck 
at the um, termination point of the I-4 express lanes in the westbound direction. That is basically that um, orange arrow that you see on the screen. That's where the I-4 express lanes from I-4 Ultimate are um, ending. Um, so during our evaluation, like I mentioned, uh, we we're forecasting that bottleneck and that's because we realized that about half of the vehicles that are traveling in the express lanes going west, they wanna continue going west and they wanna bypass all those interchanges in between. They don't, they wanna bypass Sand Lake, 528, Central Florida, um, and 535. So what the tube does is that it provides an opportunity for, um, for those vehicles to continue going west um, and bypassing those interchanges. Um, the, we call it the tube because once you're at, once you pass that last exit point where the orange arrow is or where I for ultimate ends, you stay in that tube until the tube ends and that's west of uh, stereo 536. The tube will improve safety and operations at the termination point of the express lanes in the westbound direction. It will better accommodate future population increases and support economic growth. The tube is considered an interim project that will support the traffic that's being projected in the next 10 years. Next slide, please. So here's a typical section of the tube. And as I mentioned, uh, you could see the, the lanes in the westbound direction. We are widening to the inside um, with the full lane and the full shoulder. And we're um, using the buffer separation with express lane or tubular markers, express lane markers. So this is a new tool that's available to us that was mentioned in my prior slides. I wanted to point out in this slide that as you can see here, one of the other things that we've been doing at the district is with these new tools that are available, with knowing that, that we, need, we need more work on I-4, but how do we do this? Um, how do we come up with cost savings ideas to be able to get these projects funded, funded sooner rather than later? We are looking at I-4 uh, from a value engineering point of view. This is how we're doing our evaluation. So our value engineering vision is in line with the tube. The value engineering vision is basically providing two express lanes in each direction at grade, so widening towards the median of I-4. And then we also provide a collector distributor road in the westbound lanes. There is still room on the east side of I-4 for a future rail. That's been, um, it's always been in everyone's mind. And so I wanted to point that out. However, we also, I wanted to point out that this tube is not going to preclude um, if the rail, if, if, if everything, you know, if the rail wants to go in the median of I-4, we can go back to the original vision from the I-4 pd &E project that elevated the general use lanes and provided room for a rail in the median of I-4. So I wanted to mention that, that the tube is not gonna preclude the rail going in the median of I-4, or there's another option through our evaluation, um, where we save a significant amount of money and the rail could go in the east side of I-4. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna go over how we plan to implement and build the tube along with the other projects that were already in the works. We had two interchanges that were already in the works um, from our, evalu our evaluation. Next slide, please. Okay, so as I mentioned, we already had two projects that we were working on. They were already funded for construction. The first one was the Sand Lake Road interchange at I-4, and then the second was the second one was the Daryl Carter project interchange. Another thing that we realized while we were doing our evaluation and after we came up with, with, the, with the tube is that obviously the tube is going to extend through all of these projects, being Sand Lake and Daryl Carter. So we needed to tweak a little bit the scope of these projects because we want contractors to work next to each other and coordinate during construction, but we, it's definitely not desirable to have contractors working on top of each other. So this is how we plan to deliver the tube. The first project will be building the Sand Lake Road interchange and a portion of the tube. And that is going basically from uh, west of Sand Lake Road to west of Central Florida Parkway. This is a proposed design build project in fiscal year 2022, and is shown here with the letter A. 
The second project is going to be the Daryl Carter interchange with the portion of the tube within the Daryl Carter project limits. This is a design bit build project in fiscal year 2022 and is shown here with the letter B. Next slide, please. And then finally, the last portion of the tube is also going to go with additional improvements that we identified through our evaluation at the Stereo 535 interchange and I-4. Um, this is a proposed design build project in fiscal year 2023. I wanted to also mention that the tube is not intended to be open to traffic until all of the segments of the tube are built. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now I'm going to uh, pass it over to Todd and he's gonna go into details onto um, those projects A, B, and C. All right, um, good morning, everyone. My name is Todd Helton. I'm a FDOT project manager for I-4 Beyond the Ultimate. Um, I'm going to start with the uh, Sand Lake and I-4 interchange project, as well as the portion of the westbound express lane um, that Catalina was talking about, we are calling the tube. Um, that portion from west of Central Florida Parkway to west of State Road 528 will go with the Sand Lake interchange project. Uh, next, next slide, please. So for the uh, Sand Lake and I-4 interchange project, um, we're going to reconfigure the interchange to a diverging diamond. Uh, to help move traffic more efficiently and safely. Um, the project's also going to include lengthening and reconfiguring some ramps to, um, to uh, help uh, with capacity issues there. Um, our current design also includes the elimination of the left turn lane from uh, westbound Sand Lake to southbound Turkey Lake Road. Um, in place of the left turn, the design is going to include this new loop ramp that's shown with the yellow line there. Um, and it'll be accessed from the right hand lane of westbound Sand Lake Road. The new loop ramp will move traffic to Turkey Lake Road more efficiently and eliminate the need for motorists exiting I-4 westbound to, uh, to merge multiple lanes in a short time, in a short distance to get to southbound Turkey Lake. Um, the loop ramp will also use Use, be used by motorists from westbound I-4 who will be able to exit directly to Turkey Lake Road um, from the loop ramp from I-4. And the new diverging diamond will include protected walkways for pedestrians and uh, bike lanes for cyclists, as well as uh, enhanced aesthetics. Next slide. Okay, so um, this 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 image here shows the typical um, that will be constructed with the Sand Lake project and um, in the kind of in the interchange limits. So um, it'll include reconstructing the I-4 general use lanes from west of Sand Lake Road to the end of I-4 Ultimate, and the addition of two barrier separated express lanes in the westbound direction from west of Sand Lake to the end of I-4 Ultimate. Uh, the eastbound ingress point to the express lanes will, will remain as is being built by I-4 Ultimate. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, here, here we see the uh, typical for the tube. So the two westbound express lanes uh, will transition to the single buffer separated express lane in the westbound direction, west of Sand Lake Road, and tie in just west of Central Florida Parkway. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, the express lane will be worked on as a part of three separate projects with the finished lane extending from Sand Lake Road area to west of State Road 536. Next slide. Um, these are a few key dates for the procurement for the Sand Lake project. Um, we uh, had our advertisement on October 25th, um, short listing in December, and final selection in June of next year. Okay, and now I'm going to talk about the Daryl Carter Parkway Interchange Drainage Improvements Project. Um, so, as we mentioned, a portion of the tube is within the Daryl Carter Project. Um, in order to avoid contractors working on top of each other, we're incorporating this portion of the tube into the Daryl Carter Project. Um, but to make this change to the design, we need to adjust the schedule for the Daryl Carter Interchange Project. Um, However, a portion of the project will still go ahead and uh, 
be built as a separate early work project. This portion includes the drainage improvements at uh, Big Sand Lake and will stay on the current schedule letting in January of 2022. We, we know how important these improvements are to Orange County and the community, and we're committed to maintaining that current schedule. Next slide. And now I'll talk a little more about the Daryl Carter Parkway interchange itself, as well as the portion of that westbound express lane that'll be constructed with that project. Okay, so the second major I-4 beyond the ultimate project in the works is the creation of new I-4 interchange at Daryl Carter Parkway. Currently, Daryl Carter crosses I-4 on an overpass between the interchanges of Central Florida Parkway and Apopka Vineland Road. Um, the area is going undergoing rapid development uh, with several residential hospitality and retail projects in planning or under construction. This interim project will convert Daryl Carter Parkway overpass into a DDI. This improvement will relieve congestion at the I-4 and Apopka Vineland Road interchange uh, to the west by offering an alternate route to the nearby destinations along the south end of I-Drive and to Apopka Vineland Road and Winter Garden Vineland Road. Um, the new interchange will feature three ramps so we'll have an eastbound I-4 entrance ramp, um, eastbound I-4 exit ramp, uh, westbound I-4 exit ramp. The westbound I-4 entrance ramp would be constructed with a future project. Next slide. And again, here's the typical for the tube. Um, so like the Sand Lake project, I-4 and Doral Carter Parkway uh, will include a single buffer separated express lane from west of Daryl Carter Parkway to west of Central Florida Parkway. And next slide. And here, a uh, few key dates for the Daryl Carter procurement. Um, we have production in March of 22, uh, advertising in May of 22, and a final selection in June. Okay, and finally, um, we're at the uh, I-4 and State Road 535 interchange improvements, as well as that last portion of that uh, westbound express lane or two from um, west of State Road 536 to west of Daryl Carter Parkway. So the third major I-4 beyond the ultimate project in the works includes the last piece of the tube from west of Daryl Carter Parkway to west of State Road 536 and the reconstruction of the State Road 535 and I-4 interchange. The interchange improvements include a displaced left at the State Road 535 and I-4 interchange and an echelon intersection at Vineland Road and State Road 535. Uh, the echelon intersection is an innovative design that is typically used where two busy streets intersect. Um, it resembles half of a flyover intersection uh, with one direction of the busier road elevated while the other direction meets the intersecting road at ground level. Um, if you can see in this image, the southbound State Road 535 leg is elevated while the northbound leg is at grade. Um, FDOT anticipates letting this project um, as a design build in 2023. So we expect to come back to Met Metro Plan with more details um, about this project later. Next slide. And again, um, finally, the, the last segment of, this, of the tube, um, it's gonna include the single buffer separated express lane from west of State Road 536 to west of Daryl Carter Parkway. Um, and then the idea is once all the segments are constructed, um, then the express lane would be open to traffic. And now I'll hand it back to Catalina to finish it up. Thank you, Todd. So we just hope that today's presentation was informative and that clearly explained um, the reasoning behind the tube and why it's needed and why it's so important. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, it provides those users that want to continue going west um, that opportunity to do so without having to interact with the traffic at those interchanges. It will increase safety in um, operations where the I for Ultimate Express lanes end in the westbound direction. Um, it will accommodate future growth and support um, economic growth. So later in the agenda after this presentation, there's going to be two uh, voting um, items. And um, so we, we hope that you support the, the voting of those items. Um, the, the tip one is for the additional cost to build the tube. So we need to widen to the median that additional asphalt that's needed. 
um, additional tolling um, gantry to toll the tube as well as drainage elements that are needed to treat the runoff from the tube. Um, and then the other one, the MTP is so that, you know, it's consistent with um, the tube is cost feasible. Um, and that's it, that's all I have. So right now we'll take any questions that you might have. All right, thank you very much. Um, first, I'll recognize those uh, participating virtually. Does anyone have any questions for the Beyond the Ultimate team? There are no raised hands on the virtual side. All right, in the room, anyone? All right, I'll ask some questions then. Um, so you said rail is still a possibility. Can you go over that a little bit more of, it won't go in the median anymore, it's gonna go? So so it's the, the original pd &E had the general use lanes and a viaduct and the express lanes were at grade. And there was a, a 44 foot rail envelope in the median of I-4. That's what the original pd &E had. The, the challenge with that is that those, those segments that came out of the pd &E study were mega projects in the billions of dollars. And we have new tools that are available to us, including the buffer separation. So what we have been doing is we're trying to maintain the purpose and need from the pd &E and provide similar traffic operations and safety improvements, but we wanna use these new tools and see if we can segment smaller size projects that are more cost feasible so we can get these projects funded for construction. Um, so the, the vision that we have with the value engineer BTU is bring everything at grade. So we are not gonna be elevating any of the lanes, but, but by bringing everything at grade, we go into the median of I-4. There is still room, however, on the eastbound lanes of, on the east side of I-4 for a rail, for a rail structure to go in there. So it have to be elevated, I guess. That would be elevated. So we're not, it's not going to be precluded. The tube, um, whether we build the value engineer vision or we build the, the pd &E vision, the tube will also help us to maintain traffic during construction of the future phase uh, of BTU, whatever that might be. So the tube is not going to preclude the option of the rail going in the medium of I-4. Okay. And then the these tube improvements, do they get torn out with the ultimate cross-section that um, of the express lanes? So whatever vision, whatever the ultimate might be, the elevated, obviously it will, it will be, we will have full reconstruction of I-4 um, in that area. Okay. And then these express lanes, will they be told, like you said, toll gantry and all that, so they'll be told? There is an additional toll site that will be included as part of the tube to okay. toll the tube. And we're using the federal stimulus that um, ARPA funds to do this, or is that different funds? I believe we have the CRISA and the ARPR fund, the ARPA funds, both of those for the tube. Um, so yes, basically, yes. Okay, it, <laughs> so, like, it just seems interesting the, to me to fund a told improvement with some of these stimulus funds. Oh, okay. I, I, I know if you if you take people off of the general use lanes onto told lanes, it generally improves the, the traffic flow, but it's just interesting that we're using some stimulus funds for a profit-making endeavor. I oh, just want to point that out. That's a very good question. Um, and then, real still a possibility. On the Daryl Carter and the Sand Lake, those were just accelerating those projects, right? Yeah, there were the Sand Lake, it's it, that one already, it's advertised as a design build project. It's going to include a portion of the tube. The Daryl Carter project, we did push the letting out uh, a few months to include the tube within Daryl, but we kept some of the drainage improvements as part of the early works project mm -hmm. that we're calling it, um, because we know that it's important to the community in Orange County to address those drainage um, needs in that area. Okay. Um, and then, what was the other question? Um, so this is just a, a different question, but on the I-4 corridor, since you guys are there, um, the DDI that's going in at Osceola Polk Line Road, I think it's 532, does that fix the bottleneck that's there on the western portion of I-4 in the, in the corridor? It would help. The, we are also adding auxiliary lanes on I-4 from County Road 532 and then along 
429 as well. That is going to relieve some of that. Okay, um, we are adding lanes there. We're adding ox lanes. So it's going to add that capacity in that area. Um, yeah, I think that project is under construction now. It just okay. started construction. I just It's one of those, this is a, um, a, a future bottleneck that we're seeing that we're fixing. And I'm like, well, there's a massive one there yes. currently. <laughs> so as long as we have that in the works, I know the DDI was happening. I didn't realize the ox lanes were happening as well. So yeah. anyone else have any questions? All righty. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we'll move back to our remaining two action items for today. Um, our next item is an amendment to the 2045 MTP. Mr. Trogger of uh, Metroplan Orlando staff will present the information. Turn this on. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it feels a little odd, but it's almost been two years since I've actually been at this podium. So uh, bear with me, many presentations uh, since then, but you know, all from, the com all from the comfort of my home. Yeah, so in the penalty box, either way. So. Um, good morning. And again, I think as you saw in, in the format of today's agenda, um, we learned a lot of information today from DOT um, that actually now comes to an action item, both for the MTP and then following this for the Transportation Improvement Program. But I'm here to present on behalf of uh, DOT an uh, MTP amendment um, to support the I-4 Beyond the Ultimate projects um, that you saw this morning. And we do, Nick and I both have acknowledged that this is a little unorthodox of a process for us. Um, typically, when we amend the plan, um, we're revising a table to some degree. Um, um, although, you know, I guess in this instance, um, for I-4 and for assist projects specifically, um, when we adopted the 2045 plan in December, we actually adopted um, FDOT's CIS cost feasible plans by reference um, because those funds are controlled um, by central office and, and don't really fit into our kind of uh, discretionary or, or do not fit into our formula. Um, you know, funding streams. Um, so they have the authority over that, that strategic intermodal system. So again, we adopt um, their plans by reference. Um, at that time, you know, we brought those projects in as they adopted. But, but since then, as you learned, DOT has been doing value engineering, reevaluating, uh, you know, a lot of factors, um, you know, as in, relate, um, in regards to these projects. Um, so now, um, based on FDOT's uh, evaluation, they believe these projects are now actually consistent with FDOT's uh, CIS cost, cost feasible plan. And, and based on that determination from uh, FDOT central office, that, that now prompts us to amend the MTP. And that's why I'm, I'm here this morning um, in support of, of this amendment in your agenda packets at tab three um, is a board action fact sheet that uh, specifies some of the changes that will be made um, and, and again, a letter from FDOT central office um, with the determination of cost feasibility. Um, so with that, um, we are requesting on, on behalf of FDOT, these amendments to the 2045 plan as presented, um, you know, with the understanding though, that when FDOT comes forward with the final SIS documentation, uh, we will be coming back um, to amend as necessary um, with, with those specific changes. Um, so at this time, I would like to, you know, as long as you're comfortable with the concepts and information that you saw this morning, um, this amendment I would classify as procedural, as a lot of these ultimate configurations are in our long range plan and many of them are value engineered interim solutions. So with that being said, that's why this amendment is in, in front of you because those projects weren't explicitly listed, they were part of ultimate configurations. Um, but with that, um, we are looking for a motion in your support this morning on this amendment to the 2045 plan. I'll answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Trogger. Uh, anyone online with any questions? There are no raised hands online. All right, anyone in the room? All right. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve the FDOT amendment to the 2045 uh, MTP as shown in tab three? So moved. A uh, motion by Mayor Cole. Second. Three seconds. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed like side. Item passes unanimously. All right, our final action item is an amendment to the uh, tip to include the federal stimulus projects described in the FDOT presentation. This deals with three I-4 projects involving Darrell Carter Parkway interchange 
uh, the section at Sand Lake Road and the section west of Central Florida Parkway. To west of 528, Mr. Keith Kasky with Metropolitan Orlando staff will be presenting this information. Okay, hey, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Uh, again, this uh, follows up on the MTP amendment. Uh, the TIP is being amended to include the I-4 Sand Lake Road interchange and express lane project from State Road 528 to Kirkman Road and the express lane project from Central Florida Parkway to State Road 528. And then this also includes advancing the drainage work uh, for the I-4 Daryl Carter Parkway uh, interchange project. Uh, one thing I wanted to clarify based on the other, the uh, earlier question, the, the funds for these uh, projects in the TIP amendment don't include the, you know, the ARPA funds, the stimulus funds. Uh, these are just the regular SIS funds that are normally used uh, for the I-4 projects. And uh, this amendment is needed uh, for FDOT to meet their procurement schedules for these projects. And you all have the information on this in tab four in your packets. So with that, unless there's any questions, uh, we're asking for your approval for the amendment. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone online have any questions? There are no raised hands on the virtual side. All right, in person. All right, do I hear a motion to approve the FDOT amendment to the 21, 22 to 25, 26 TIP? Mm -hmm. All right, uh, a motion for approval by Mayor Anderson. Do I hear a second? Second. All right, we have a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed like side? Item passes unanimously. Now for our final two presentations for the day. Um, first, Ms. Uh, Whittington with Metropolitan Orlando staff uh, will be providing us a preview of our legislative priorities for this upcoming session. Take it away. Thank you. Um, those of you who are also joining online, good morning. You have a copy of the draft version of the uh, priorities at your places. If you wanna take a look at them using this newfangled technology that we have in front of us this morning, it's available on the Taden. Um, there's a copy that's gonna be shared on the screen and you have also received a copy via email on this morning. So we wanted to just uh, briefly highlight the 2022 proposed priorities for Metro Plan Orlando. This is something that we do each year um, as the Metro Plan Orlando um, goes on record with its positions regarding transportation re um, related legislation. Much of what you're going to see today are rollovers or carryovers from last year. Um, transportation did not get a, um, a lot of attention and from our team in Tallahassee, we're receiving the same feedback that this year will likely be a, um, I'm, this is my word, not theirs, a vanilla year for transportation. And the reason is two things are gonna be taking a lot of attention, redistricting and elections. And so what we want to do is to continue to place our priorities before our legislative delegation and pay attention to those things that may arise during the legislative session that will require the board's action and response from us. So you see our top priorities, one of which on last year you saw that is not there. I wanna start with the, um, the initiative that we had to um, get transportation funding to expand the best foot forward for pedestrian safety program in Central Florida. While we were successful in getting $100,000 through the House and Senate, that requested appropriation did not survive the governor's veto pen. And that came with a risk. And that risk was that if the item was vetoed, that DOT was restricted from putting money into that program for one year. And so we have been able to work with DOT and speak with 
the, the new safety administrator, Lorreen Bobo in the, the Office of um, Safety Administration. And we have made some advancements to be able to look at local options for expanding that program, including um, uh, some possible grant opportunities that that may um, that that exist that they're able to apply for, and so we've removed that item not because it's not a good item, but because we don't want to take that risk. If we want to see um, some movement in this area in terms of safety in the pedestrian. Um, in the area of pedestrian safety, then we, we don't, do not want to take that risk again. We do want to work uh, cooperatively and locally to look for opportunities. So what we are doing is sending a signal to the legislature that it is our desire to see increased funding in the transportation trust fund. But you might ask, why are we saying that does not negatively impact the state transportation trust fund? And what we mean by that is if there's stimulus money coming in, if there's money, new money coming in from a different source, we don't want that to affect um, anything in the work program that would be supplanted or that money would be moved out to make room for, for money, but then it stays the same. What we're looking for is additional funds. Um, the same with the Transportation Disadvantaged Trust Fund. That program is really being squeezed. We're really having a challenge locally with meeting the needs um, of the TD population. Um, some of what we have heard even locally uh, recently is that they've had to, Lynx has had to go back to their board to get some additional funding to increase wages for uh, paratransit drivers. Um, they're having a problem competing with drivers who are driving packages versus drivers who are driving people. And so um, they are, they are at, at a place now where they're increasing the, the driver's wages. And of course that comes, that comes at, a, at a cost. And so we're wanting to see some additional increases to transportation disadvantaged trust fund. And then lastly, we have not been able over the past few years to get this one across the the, the goal line to um, make sure that we see cyclists included among those listed in the law um, characterized as um, classified as vulnerable road users. The legislation that we will support are, again, their rollovers, it's things that you've seen before. We're looking for local options to use the tools that are already in our toolkit differently. So, um, the, we're looking for increased transportation investment through some dedicated and sustainable funding opportunities. These are also being advanced by the um, state MPOAC. So we are riding along with them in these endeavors. The support for advancement of innovative transportation mobility solutions. Again, this is the TISMO, the um, ACES, the automated vehicles. We're, we've been a leader in this area and we wanna to continue to do what we can to um, advance those opportunities in the state. And lastly, um, we are supporting legislation that allows us to conduct meetings um, virtually in times of declared emergencies. Um, there was a, a couple of hiccups when we first started um, during the pandemic where we were not able to hold certain meetings because they did not, um, because of the Florida Sunshine Law, but we want to, to be able to add some, um, some additional cushion in that for us to be able to move forward. Um, Marianne, if you could go up just a little bit more. The items that are on the monitor legislation list um, are again here to signal the position that the Metro Plan Orlando Board has taken previously. All of these proposed priorities have been previewed with members of the executive committee and the Metro Plan Board is expected to take action on this full set of priorities at its meeting um, on November 10th. Um, but with regard to any legislation that seeks to, uh, to repeal um, distracted that regulate further regulates distracted driving by prohibiting the use of handheld two-way devices. We've monitored that in the past and the board has um, given us their support for that item. If something were to change, we would come back to the Metro Plan Orlando board and ask again what their position is. Those things that you see in parens are those are the current the, the current position of the board. If, the, if this comes in a different flavor, then we would bring it back and they would tell us 
um, which way to go. Anything that alters, revises, or rescinds the red light camera legislation, um, we're monitoring it. They had previously taken a position of opposition that they did not want to see those um, repealed. Um, and so again, it, it's there as a, as a reminder. Um, this mid block crossing designation is one that has come in the last couple of years. It's shown it's come back twice and we're anticipating that it will come back again. Um, we've monitored this, but not taken um, a position on it. We've kind of just watched and waited to see what the legislature was going to do, but kept it on the radar. And um, we've gotten the direction to do that again as we move into the 22, the 22 session. Um, and then last year, this last one came as a surprise um, where there were initiatives to diminish the role of regional planning councils. The Metro Plan Orlando Board opposed that. And so if it comes back, it will likely be their position again. Um, the last two items are agency action items. The first of which is um, there's a concern that there's a state practice that um, certain federal dollars that come into the state get classified as uh, get state restrictions attached to it. Um, the MPOAC sees that as a legislative um, issue to get legislators involved. And we um, slightly differ in, in opinion and feel that we are able to work with Department of Financial Services and FDOT to be able to work through this without getting the legislature involved. So we have it there as, um, as a reminder that we are working with those departments um, collectively to try and resolve this before the state gets involved. And then lastly, um, uh, to remind us and DOT and the board that we are working cooperatively with the Department of Transportation to integrate those projects into the region that use those federal stimulus dollars. We're also asking the board to approve the authorization of the executive committee to act in the meantime and in between time. So things happen pretty quickly. And in those times that things happen and we need the board to respond and we can get the executive committee together more quickly than we can the entire board to respond to things that may um, we, we may need direction on. So that um, is the 2022 positions. This is for information to you all today. If there's anything that you all are aware of or would like us to monitor, um, we would love to hear from you and um, add those to the, the proposed list. So I'm here to take any questions. All right, thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any questions for Ms. Whittington? Yes. Um, this is probably just for my education, but you know, this where we talk about local option discretionary taxes, is that really anticipating the renewed vigor behind the local sales tax option, or is that totally different? Well, it, it goes into it's in the same category. Okay. There are um, local option discretionary taxes um, that we have the ability to implement locally right now. For instance, one of them is the local option discretionary tax that can only be used for capital. We would like some flexibility in that to be able to use it for operations as well. Um, and then there last year during the session, there was an initiative to change the timing by which local governments could um, put a local tax on a referendum. So that's where it fits into that renewed um, desire to go after a tax and to um, limit the number of years. So we, we're hopeful that they don't do anything that further restricts us from doing what we can do locally. Thank you. Anyone else online or in person? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's really good to see you all. Thank you very much. All right, closing us up today will be Mr. Tyler with DOT to present status on the I4 Ultimate project. Good morning again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm uh, pleased to, to, to be back up and, and, and talk about another exciting project that's actually reaching its conclusion, and that's the I4 Ultimate project. 
Um, so I gave this presentation to the board back in September and uh, back again to, uh, to, to share it with all the committees. So the, the information that you see on the, on the, the, some of the statistics, it's actually two months old. Uh, so with that, we'll, we'll jump right on into it. Next slide, please. So if you don't know by now, the, uh, the I-4 Ultimate is a 21 mile reconstruction of I-4 through the, through the heart of downtown Orlando, uh, major reconstruction of 15 interchanges, uh, bringing the, the roadway up to current safety standards and, and ultimately adding four express lanes to in each direction uh, at the, that will be opening up at the beginning of next year. Next slide, please. So this is the, the typical section that you can see out there today. It, uh, this, is, this, is, this was our goal from the beginning. And uh, if you're driving down the corridor, you're, you're seeing it come to life. So we've got the, the completely rebuilt general use lanes on the outside. All of those lanes are open to traffic. Uh, we open those up in their final configuration at the tail end of uh, 2020 and uh, all of the ramps for those 15 interchanges as well. And then for, for the last year, we've been working on finishing up the, the express lanes there in the, in the medium. Next slide, please. Our, just mentioned this, that we opened up those general use lanes and, and, and basically that was a dramatic uh, improvement for the, for the traveling public. If you've, if you've been on the corridor uh, since that time, it is a, it is a marked improvement over uh, you know, during construction and even prior to. Uh, so, we, so we really enjoyed the, the mobility benefits uh, from that new facility opening up uh, again uh, almost a year ago. Uh, since then, we've, we've, you know, in addition to the express lanes, uh, we, we didn't have everything completely done on those general use lanes. You've been seeing the friction course and the pavement markings going down. We continue to restore the, the crossroads, uh, the landscaping and aesthetics are going in. And uh, we expect to substantially complete the project uh, right here at the, as we close out uh, 2021 with final uh, acceptance uh, later this uh, next, this spring. Next slide, please. The express lanes are well on their way. They're much over 90% complete. Nine of nine toll buildings are now installed. And uh, you can see those, the, those testing and installations going on uh, throughout the corridor. Uh, and again, the express lanes are gonna be opening to traffic in uh, the first part of next year. Next slide, please. So a little bit more about the, those express lanes and the, and, and the tolls. We do get a lot of questions about that. Um, you know, the, the, the express lanes, there's are essentially an additional mobility choice that Central Florida travelers are, are going to have. And over the last uh, seven plus years, we've actually uh, offered up quite a number of additional mobility choices if you're traveling through Central Florida. Uh, and so I'm going back seven years and that's SunRail. SunRail opened up almost seven years ago, a little over seven years ago, and we've expanded it down into, into Osceola County. We're currently working on an expansion up, up to DeLand. That was an additional mobility choice. The Wakaiva Parkway is also under construction and it's going to be completed in the tail end of 2022, early 2023. That is another mobility choice for Central Florida that is coming online. And then the, uh, you know, the a third one will be the express lane. So still on that same main line for, for I-4, but, uh, it, but it's an additional mobility choice. What motorists can choose to, uh, to, to pay for is that, that reliable travel time to get them to their destination. So what will that toll be? It's going to be displayed on the signs, you know, before they enter into the facility, they're going to have two opportunities to, 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 you know, to kind of get a visual check of what's that toll going to be uh, for the destination that I'm interested in. And I'm going to show you, you know, how that's going to look uh, on the corridor in just a moment. Uh, that, that toll amount is going to increase as demand for the utilization of the express lanes goes up, the toll amount is going to go up. And that's so that we can provide that reliable travel time. That's the, that's the, that's the transaction. That's the decision that's being made by the motorist is, you know, is it important to me to get to my destination on time that I'm willing to pay that toll? So it, again, it gives you an option. And uh, for every, every uh, motorist that chooses to use those express lanes, it benefits the general use lanes. It's literally one less car in the general use lanes for every, every motorist that, uh, that chooses to use those express lanes. Next slide, please. So this is the series of signs that, uh, that motorists will see as they're approaching one of our slip ramps where they can enter into uh, the express lanes from, uh, from the I-4 main line. So you can see there are the two signs that will uh, reflect the, the toll amount for the, the, you know, the first couple of, of destinations. Uh, once they get into the express lanes and they start reaching those destinations, they'll be presented with additional signs that will let them know, you know if you want to continue on, 
uh, your journey east or west, what that total amount is going to be to the next uh, series of, uh, of, of exit points. Next slide, please. So this is an all electronic tolling uh, system. There will be no uh, 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 cat, it's a completely cashless, no, uh, no, uh, no, no, no toll sites uh, to, to stop at. Uh, and we, are, we also do not have a toll by plate option, but we do have a very extensive uh, interoperability program with, uh, with other uh, electronic tolling agencies around the, 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 the Southeast. Next slide, please. So now that we're getting ready to, to open this facility, it becomes important to start educating the public, not on construction. That's been our focus over the last seven years is, you know, what's going on with construction. Now it's to start to, to educate drivers about how to use this new mobility choice that's being offered. It is compl complicated. You know, it's going to take a little bit of time to understand it. So we're going to revamp our website. We're going to be providing some outreach materials. We're going to be working with, uh, with our media uh, partners to to ensure that we have a lot of information going out to the general public about the availability of these express lanes and how to use them to uh, to, to their greatest advantage. Next slide, please. We've also been working with our first responder partners uh, to make sure that the the operation of these new new express lanes we can get in there uh, and do what we need to do. If there is an incident, we're going to have additional road rangers. Uh, for those express lanes and again working with uh, fire and, and law enforcement on how we're going to uh, you know respond to incidents that uh, that occur within those those express lanes our, our regional traffic management center uh, located in sanford is going to be our eye in the sky quarterbacking you know what's what's happening along the system and we do have 10 emergency access gates that's the picture you see there on the bottom of your screen that will allow uh, access into the express lane system for those responders, as well as we'll be able to get traffic out of the express lane system should there be a reason that it has to be closed because of an incident. Next slide, please. And, uh, you know, that's all I have for you today. We're, we're really looking forward to opening up those express lanes and, and bringing this chapter of I-4 to a, to a close. And, and uh, I think it's really fitting that, uh, you know, earlier this morning, you heard about what we hope to do for our next chapter uh, as well and, and getting that, uh, those next series of projects uh, to continue these improvements of I-4, both north and south, um, are already on the drawing board and, and moving ahead. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Anyone in person or online that has any questions for Mr. Tyler? There are no raised hands on the virtual side. Aaron, how does that access gate work? It looks pretty darn rigid. <laughs> and it does need to be. Um, it will work. Uh, it has a manual crank. It also has a power that can be, uh, it can be uh, uh, opened automatically, you know, under power, you know, automatically. It just and, slides back. Yeah, slides it just slides back. back. Okay. And it can be, that that power can be activated, that power opening feature can be activated there on site through a keypad uh, for first responders, but it can also be activated uh, remotely from our RTMC so that, you know, we're watching what's happening there with an incident. So as we see people, you know, the responders coming up, we can go ahead and get those gates open. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much. All right, thank you. All right, uh, there are several items under our general information uh, tab five of your agenda packet, um, including the legislative priorities that uh, Ms. Winnington um, presented to us. Our upcoming meetings of interest, our next MAC meeting will be December 4th, 2021. Our December meeting will also be in a hybrid format. So please uh, make sure to RSVP so we can have a quorum present. And then the next Metro Plan Orlando board meeting will be next week, November 10th, um, in, uh, fully in person. At, any, at this time, do any committee members have any final uh, questions or comments? I've got one, and, and it's a little thing. Just wanted to let the board know that Avenue B in Oviedo has been renamed Adeline B. Tinsley uh, Avenue. And it's an honor of a woman who did all kinds of wonderful civic things in our community. So I'm hoping that we can rename that on any documents uh, that have to do with Metro Plan from here on out. Perfect. You getting a head nod out of uh, Mr. Chugger? All right, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Sladek. All right. 
Um, and then if any member of the public wishes to comment, please raise, uh, use your raise hand function or um, dial star nine on your phone. Uh, and then we'll unmute your mic. After you're recognized, please state your name and address for the record and limit your comments to two minutes. Do we have any public comments? In person, online, virtual, smoke signals, anything? <laughs> there are no raised hands at this time on the attendee side. All right, perfect. All right, thank you very much. Does anyone else have anything for the good of the order? All right, we stand adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>